Thank you, thank you, Marge. Um, first of all, um, I really want to express my, my deepest sincerity to Metropolis, to Susan, to the judges of the competition, to Herman Miller for the sponsorship. So thank you very much for that. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, the project and how it got started. And to begin, this has been going on for five years. This happened right after graduate school. Um, a lot of the materials that I was working on in graduate school were materials that perhaps dissolved or were made of materials that were naturally found. Um, and what was happening, uh, at least when I was doing a lot of material research, is that I was realizing that materials had a lot of uh, embodied energy. They required a lot of heat processes to be made. And so I really started to ask the question, what if we could grow architectural materials? And after starting that initial inquiry, looking at how coral develops, uh, looking at how shells grow, looking at natural processes, I then started deepening the question to what if we could grow architectural materials with microorganisms. And so that adventure started five years ago. Of course, I do not have a background in science. I have a background in design and architecture. So for the past five years, I have worked a lot in labs. I have read very many books. I have uh, thrown myself into the science industry and have been quite happy that they have allowed me uh, to come in with open arms. Uh, this project, uh, I've, I've entitled it Bio Biomanufactured Brick. Um, right now its current scale is one-fifth of a uh, standard size American brick. And the process that it uses to grow is um, loose sand and a bacteria called Sporus arsena pasteuri yeast extract to feed the bacteria, calcium chloride as a growth media and mixed with urea, and water. And basically those are all the materials that are needed to um, fuse together all the sand grains and, and make a consolidated material. Um, so when I thought about growing this material, it was you know, never really growing like in this direction, but rather actually growing inside. Um, What's happening physically is that the bacteria are increasing the pH of the system and causing precipitation to happen around the cells. So to put it simply, I'm killing bacteria by turning them into crystals around grains of sand. Um, and, and one thing that started this inquiry, um, specifically, you know, this material, it could be in any form, it could be in any shape, it could be of any scale, but something that goes deep and, and some of the past work that I've done is really this love of a brick. Um, if we look at a brick, it's the most common denominator of architectural global construction. Um, it's very simple, it's very humble, and it, it doesn't take much skill in terms of implementing it and, and making an architecture with it. Um, however, fired clay brick has quite high embodied energy. So, what I'm looking at is modern and traditional methods of construction versus the biological method. Um, the, the modern and fired brick essentially uses wood, um, firewood or coal to be burned in order to make the brick. Uh, of course, this set aside from sun-fired brick, which of course just uses the wonderful power of the sun in terms of baking it. Um, but because it uses a lot of energy, that's not just included in the firing process, it's also included in the excavation and the transportation of the material once it's complete. Um, and we produce over 1.23 trillion bricks per annum. That's worldwide. And that number keeps going up and up and up. And 70% of the brick construction happens in India and in China. And most of the third world practices of that um, development use uh, traditional fired kilns that emit quite an abundant amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere per year. So one uh, number that I came up with that was just quite interesting is for 25,000 bricks it takes 400 trees. So that's, that's quite a lot of uh, a material economy that goes into this. So right, this is the high energy dependency. Um, when we compare the high energy dependency versus the biomanufactured brick, it only needs a solar power to um, basically rotate the bacteria medium. Um, the bacteria, if you just, basically it's called inoculation, if you put them in a container of a media, they require oxygen, so you have to shake it. Um, so right now what I'm working on is a, a large 
basically called a bioreactor so that these bacteria can grow in a, in a larger volume. So I'm only right now, even from the outset, limiting myself to only using naturally um, powered resources. Okay. So this is um, looking at the laboratory experiment. Um, essentially how the brick is grown is that it has to be uh, dripped with a media that you can see here that goes um, over the loose sand and catches inside of a container. And of primary interest is keeping this closed loop. I'm not interested in any waste going into the groundwater. I'm not interested in any waste actually becoming thrown away, but instead of recycling that, that system back up. Um, the current scale, as I mentioned, is one-fifth, and the day it finally worked, it was literally like a little baby brick um, in a little Petri dish. <laughs> I, I still, I actually brought it with me today. It's a little baby break. Oh, let's see. This is just a little baby break. So all, all this work in five years, and this, but it's very much worth it. Okay. Um, so what you can uh, see basically with a microscope is, of course, quite quite amazing. And, you know, if you look at the little brick, um, it basically just looks like sandstone. I mean, it's, it has a little bit of, of white calcium deposits on top. Um, but it, when you look at the micrographic images, you can start to see that around the grains of sand, where the bacteria have basically gone around the sand grains, they turn into crystals, and then the crystals basically start fusing and holding hands. And so that's the material that it's, essentially, it's like replacing Portland. Portland as the binder and concrete. So the, the crystals go around that. Okay, now the two approaches that I've um, looked at mostly into this is an analog and a digital. And there's something really poetic to me about just being able to take, you know, a container of media, make some form work, put it on the sand, and voila, you have a brick. Especially in a lot of countries where there's not a lot of natural resources, where there simply is only sand in terms of a construction material to use. I live in the uh, United Arab Emirates right now, and I have all the materials that I ever will need. So, um, so this illustration just basically shows the steps that one would go through in terms of making this material. Um, there's another process that I'm looking at, which is more of a digital. Um, Having just uh, finished building a 3D printer a couple years ago, the fab at home, the faber, um, you can put any material you want into the 3D printer. It can be cheese or bacteria. So the, look, putting a, a bacteria media and basically dripping that media onto a bed of sand and literally growing it into different layers. And um, basically, to, to finalize about where I am right now, of course, I was really happy the day that the baby brick came around. But, of course, full scale is the next big, big uh, challenge for me. And um, right now, it's still working in the lab. But I need, of course, to develop many, many, many more collaborations than I already have in terms of what these implications will mean. I do know that there is a risk of pollution that can be caused with this, but that only happens if you don't catch the waste. So this waste can be caught, transferred back into the system, and reincorporated to make the bricks. Um, also the solar bioreactor, that's something else that I'll be rolling my sleeves up and in making this summer. Um, and also there's potential of an opportunity to go to Ethiopia um, and just put this material thing in order and, and get it going. But fortunately, right now, I do live in the desert, so I have a playground. And there's also, um, there's also a, uh, a chance to work with the Bedouin, which are the locals that do live in the, in the Middle East right now, that they have a semi-nomadic life. So they do go from, from tent to a semi-permanent dwelling, so I would like to work with them on that as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Metropolis, again.